Okay, so this is a brief review of Chapter 6, Errors in English, Guide to Correct Word Usage. So when it comes to correct word usage, the first thing you have to think about is diction. So diction is another way of saying how your word choices affect the way your ideas are expressed. The words you choose and how you structure your sentences will convey certain things to the reader. As you go through your writing drafts and edit them, you want to be aware of your word choice as well as your sentence structure because you want to make sure you're communicating effectively, right? That's where this effective communication comes in. It's the goal of any writing. You need to have clear, grammatically correct sentences in order to make your message well-defined and impactful for your readers. So some common problems that come up in diction, um, you know, the book recommends ways to improve your use of diction, such as being specific with your word choices, as well as being concise with your wording. So many sentences are unclear because they're muddled with poor word choices, they're too wordy or vague, which can confuse the reader and destroy the paper's flow. You want to be direct, which will help you limit wordiness. So one, the book also argues that sometimes we take advantage or we take uh, for granted what we say will be interpreted by the reader in the way we think it'll be interpreted. So current use is one of these issues. You want your words to be understandable to readers, so there's one consideration that should be if your word choice is still in current use. Some words are obsolete, like, you know, rarely do you hear someone say anon, right? <laughs> Which is something you might hear people say in Shakespearean plays, right? And some words are archaic, meaning they've left common usage, such as the word baguette, right? Which has, you know, been replaced with other more modern words, or... You know, there might be words that may be in use in historical texts or legal texts or the Bible, right? Or other things that still have some influence in the culture, but they sound weird and outdated when you put them in your paper. There's also words that are poetic words like thine or thou, right? Which might be appropriate in poetry, but not in a research paper. There's also neologisms, which are newly coined words or phrases that slip into common use for a moment and then are gone. So the different ways these words are coined are outlined in the book, you know, such as the term smog, something familiar for Southern California residents, that's the combination of the words smoke and fog, or one of my favorite excuses to day drink, brunch, the combination of the words breakfast and lunch. So again, sometimes these words can be acronyms or sometimes slang. So you generally want to avoid usage of these terms, but there's no definite rules as language is constantly in flux, but just think whether or not other words are more appropriate or could be used to convey your message more clearly. Also, there's the issue of national use and localism. So just as language is in flux and changing, it's also culturally specific, which is why sometimes you hear British terms for things and they sound very weird to us. Like the book example of how British people call car hoods a bonnet, <laughs> right? This extends to idioms and colloquialisms that we'll talk about in a minute. But there's also the issue in terms of expressions that are specific to different geographic locations. So in the U.S., you have South or the Midwest, and those terms that you hear there tend to be localized, right? You hear different slangs and accents. So you need to think about your audience when you're writing to make sure your word choices are going to resonate. If you're using wording that's very specific to Southern California that doesn't resonate in other areas, that might be um, you know, appropriate to a paper in which the audience is Southern California residents. But if this is something that you have a wider scope of audience for, you have to be careful that you're not confusing or alienating readers that don't have those same localisms in their diction. All right. So yeah, there's more problems with diction, right? The, the chapter goes through like a whole bunch. And as always, I suggest you go through the chapter, especially through the exercises at the end of the chapter, which will help you deal with and practice dealing with a lot of the issues that I'm going over in this lecture. All right, so going back to pro problems in diction. Um, another one is shop talk. So shop talk is basically... Really just the, what you have to think about with shop talk is making sure that if you're using any technical jargon or terminology that's specific to an industry or trade, that you define its meaning to the reader. Again, remember, we may think others understand our word usage because we know what our message was or our intention was when we wrote it. 
but we need to go back through when editing and think about how the words are conveying a certain meaning or feeling. Also, colloquialisms are phrases that are often used in speech and have meaning specific to that culture. So, for example, if someone is strong and brave in our culture, in American culture, we'll often say that they have balls, right? Whether that person is male or female. A phrase like that would make little sense to those outside the culture. So, again, make sure if you're using a colloquialism that it's appropriate to the subject matter of your paper, right? You're not going to just say, this researcher had balls, right? Or something like that without there being like some specific, you know, um, reason to include a colloquialism such as that, right? Because that could often alienate readers or just confuse them, right? If they don't understand what the meaning of these colloquialisms are because they're very culturally specific. Um, also, there's idiomatic English and figurative language. So idioms are just groups of words or phrases that commonly break grammar rules but are common to the culture, such as something like, how do you do, right? That <laughs> breaks all sorts of grammar rules. Um, but it's something that, you know, um, that we expect someone to say, right? Or, or we're so used to using in common use that it doesn't seem as weird to us, even though it breaks a lot of grammar rules. So um, one that gets to me <laughs> is if someone says, how are you doing? I've been kind of social, socially programmed to say, good, right? And then I'll ask someone how they are doing and they'll say, well, instead of good, which I know they are grammatically correct but it bugs me <laughs> because it is something idiomatic that I'm used to hearing, right? We know that actually grammatically well makes a lot more sense because, you know, you can be well, but can you be good, right? <laughs> There's a whole different meaning. And that is really just an error in diction to say, I'm doing good, right? Instead of I'm doing well. Um, but I do it all the time, <laughs> right? So there's a lot of things that we do that we're just used to because of the way we hear other people speak is how we learn language. So these things tend to be fluid and in flux. So, um, you know, the book gives a lot of examples of idiomatic words and phrases. So my example would be words that are idioms that mean something's easy, right? And again, we use a lot of these without thinking sometimes, right? So let's say um, saying something is a piece of cake right? Um, inherently, do we know what that means? Are we really saying that that a task is like eating a piece of cake? Um, no, we're just trying to say that it's easy. So it's a way that we kind of um, make an analogy to something and then that becomes a part of our regular speech. So again, you have to be careful about your usage of these things to make sure that you're making sense to your reader. So, you know, again, there's a lot of idioms that mean something's easy. So something is a piece of cake or sometimes we'll say, Something is no sweat, meaning it didn't cause you to sweat, meaning there wasn't much labor involved, so it must have been easy, right? So again, you can understand how people that are, um, you know, ESL or English as a second language learners um, could have a lot of trouble with these idioms because they don't really make as much sense grammatically, and a lot of them have really nothing to do with what you're saying. So if you're saying, uh, someone says, oh, is that easy? You say, yeah, it's a piece of cake. Right. If you're not a native speaker, you're probably gonna be like, what the hell does that mean? Right. Or, oh, it's no sweat. Right. And you're like, well, I wasn't asking about my perspiration. Right. Or another one that we use often to say something is easy is, oh, it's a breeze. Right. Again, it makes sense to us because of the culture. But on paper, point of fact, especially for a non-native speaker, that makes absolutely no sense. Right. How does a breeze relate to something that you're doing? So we understand that all of these things mean something was easy, but if you're not a native speaker, the phrases can be elusive and confusing. So for example, I have a coworker at the library I work at who was born in Sri Lanka and she was educated in British schools and she has the most interesting idioms. Like I started trying to write them down because she says them all the time and they're so interesting, but they always hit your ear wrong because the analogies make no sense, at least within our cultural context, most of them. Right. So there's one that uh, she said the other day that I was like my personal favorite now that I had to like write it down because I was like, yes, I'm going to use that. Um, it clearly makes no sense in our culture, but it does within the way she was brought up. So, um, Basically, what she said was, uh, quote, save your breath to cool your porridge, which she was saying, referring to one of her employees, meaning don't lie to me, right? So she's like, oh, this person was calling in sick and they're saying this, this and that. And she said to them, save your breath to cool your porridge, 
right? Why does that not sink in as an appropriate idiom to us? Well, first of all, we don't call anything porridge necessarily. We would say like oatmeal, right? Or something like that. Um, so, you know, porridge isn't really as, is normative. And then of course the idea that a porridge disc, a dish is hot. So you would need to blow it, um, to cool it off. So meaning don't lie to me, save your breath, right? But save your breath has become a idiom that we accept in American culture, right? Say, oh, save your breath. Um, but rarely do we hear save your breath to cool your porridge, <laughs> right? So again, uh, these things are very culturally specific and we often don't notice them because we're not really talking to people cross-culturally as often. So again, think of the audience here. Make sure that you're using the kind of words or phrases that are appropriate to the tone of your paper and that they're necessary words. Oh, okay, also figurative language. This can be a helpful tool in your paper if it's used correctly. If not, it can be a strange distraction woven into the fabric of your paper. So some words have direct meanings and different connotations that they hint at, which is another reason to be careful when editing your drafts about which words you're using to demonstrate your points. So, you know, and I keep saying editing in this point because what I'm trying to point out is that you can't necessarily pick your perfect word choice while you're writing. Writing is one exercise. It's trying to connect the dots. It's trying to uh, convey your points. But truly, good writing is just a series of constant editing, right? You should be going back through. And I've talked about this in other lectures, but it's really because of the structure of our brains, right? We can either be analytical or creative at once. So if you're trying to be analytical and make sure that all of your words fit to the context of meaning, that's going to be very different than the kind of colorful or, you know, more figurative language that develops from a creative sense of writing, right, from the other side of your brain. When you would go through and you would give um, careful examples or illustrate with more colorful language what's happening so that the reader has more of a picture of what's going on, right? So again, sometimes using a figure of speech or a simile or a metaphor is appropriate. And I do encourage some figurative language as long as it's aimed at explaining a point about your research. Because with more colorful language, you have the opportunity to bring the reader into your perspective by painting a picture for the reader from your perspective. Um, also, there's issues with inexact or ineffective diction. So there's some suggestions the chapter gives for ineffective diction. Not necessarily things you should never do, but it cautions against things that can be damaging to your paper like exaggerations or affectations, right? So again, these rules aren't as strict as we think they are, um, as our early childhood uh, English classes told us that they were, right? Um, but again, it's more of there's certain things you should just l warn yourself against to make sure that you're not causing errors, right? There aren't um, there are cases in which a lot of these things can be included. They just have to be either carefully um, explained or fit into the network of the rest of your paper. So when it comes to euphemisms, they are typically watered down phrases many of us use to try and clean things up that are otherwise unpleasant. So there's a lot of euth euphemisms for death because death is one of those things that in the culture people don't really like to talk about, right? So there's all sorts of euphemisms. So you know, someone is pushing up daisies, they kicked the bucket, they passed on, right? We have all these nice words for saying, that person's dead, they died, they are now dead, right? It's nicer to say, oh, they kicked the bucket, you know, they, they passed on from this world to the next, right? So the problem with euphemisms is that using these can make your paper seem less formal. And unless they're used for a specific purpose, they can make the paper less clear, right? And jargon can be either industry-specific terms and phrases or simply nonsensical words or phrases, what the book refers to as gobbledygook, right? Um, so this is something to be worried about because you can't just necessarily introduce terminology without explaining what it is and situating its importance within your paper. So if you were introducing a particular term, a particular theory, um, something jargon-specific, you would basically state it, then have a sentence explaining what that means and how that connects to your paper, right? So this is where it's important to not rely so heavily on the quotes of others because oftentimes quotes will have jargon or slang or different word choice in it that um, doesn't really make sense, right? And we often put so many quotes in our paper that we're just writing paper around the quotes 
And that is not writing a paper. You need to be in the driver's seat of your paper. You need to be choosing the words. If anything, you should have no quotations or limit your quotations as much as possible so that you are the one communicating the message of your paper, right? A lot of this has to do with control and also just making sure that your message is being communicated, right? So another issue is slang, which is just non-standard vocabulary that often comes from subcultures in society. So not only is it informal, but it also tends to go in and out of use pretty quickly. So if you think of slang that was common the last time that Sean Combs changed his name, <laughs> then you know what I'm talking about, right? Sean Combs, a.k.a. Puff Daddy, a.k.a. P. Diddy, a.k.a. everything, right? Every, every year or two, right? Um, he's got a new, Sean Combs has a new name. So if you think about the terminology that was in use, like around the time when he was Puff Daddy or P. Diddy, those things are very different. Meaning, like, I remember the first time I heard my mom say something that, um, what was it? Oh, it was, oh, something was da bomb, right? And that was when I knew the word was dead in the culture, right? <laughs> it had already slipped from popular use to, you know, um, my mom, to coming out of my mom's mouth. And that just kind of made me understand that, no, that is no longer acceptable, right? So that's how slang works. It tends to be very time specific. So if you think of like words that were common in the 80s, right? Like radical, tubular, those kind of things. That's not really, um, some of those words do stay, like the word dude or things like that have been somewhat uh, prevalent for, you know, at least 40 years. But it is interesting that, um, they tend to fall out of use pretty quickly because they tend to be tied to a specific historical moment. So you have to make sure that, again, if you're using slang, that you're aware that you're using it and that you're using it for a reason and not just, you know, be, for laziness. And wordiness is basically an air of not editing enough. So you're not going to be able to write perfectly top to bottom effortlessly. Sometimes you put in too many words, but it's through revising and editing that you can look at your sentences and determine if all the extra wordiness is just weighing down the clarity and meanings of your sentences. So for example, a thing that I see commonly through a lot of people's papers, especially once they get to the proposal, between the proposal and lit review process, what I really like to stress is that you cut out anything unnecessary that is not communicating your message. So for example, and again, this is not your fault. You've just been taught the wrong way to write for a while, right? Which is that standard college paper format, which is just uh, introduction, body, body, conclusion, which is not what this paper is. And I really hope you know this by now, right? We're, we're in a few weeks now. Hopefully you, you've, you've had a grasp of this now that our format is much more, it, it's, it's a lot more structure than simply introduction, body, 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 conclusion, which is super easy to keep inside of your head and write from top to bottom because it's a pretty simple format. The difference is with something like this, this is a much more complex paper. There is no way to write it from top to bottom. Even the most skilled writers that publish these kind of academic journals all the time um, do not write top to bottom and they write in various drafts, right? So wordiness is one of those things. And again, the most common wordiness that I see is people including a whole bunch of crap about their resources that they don't need. So saying, for example, um, you know, according to Kilbourne, Right, and then you put the the hanging, or I mean the the running acknowledgement of the year in which that was published, and then what you're supposed to do is just synthesize and explain what Kilborn said. A lot of people will throw in quotes, and then they won't explain the quote. Meaning, if I just say, uh, according to Kilborn, quote, you know, uh, young women who are exposed to media sources have higher risks of eating disorders and blah blah blah. Right. If I don't then explain how that relates to my point, if the next sentence is not me explaining it, then there's no context to it. You can't just let the quotes stand by themselves. That's a huge error I see a lot. And the second error I see is ex explaining every single thing about a research study, meaning they'll say um, relying too much on the research and not enough on your voice to lead the paper. So instead of saying, according to Kilborn, um, media has negative impacts on women's health uh, health and self-esteem, right? That would be you synthesizing what she's saying. And that would be a clear way to directly source what, this, what the source is saying. Instead, people will say, according to a research article titled, and then give us the whole title of the article, 
and then saying by Jean Kilborn done in this year with these other researchers at this university they interviewed 27 people and of the 27 people they used this particular method and they analyzed the data with this other method and what they found is that media has negative influence on women's health and self-esteem meaning that in under all of that garbage there's the main point is in there but you have all this other crap like what the not only um, the citable information that's necessary, like either the author's name or, um, you know, the running indent, or I mean, that the, the um, running acknowledgement or the in-text uh, post-text citation, right? Meaning at the end of a sentence, having a citable information within the uh, parentheses. Um, that's all you need, right? You don't need to tell me that the research study was done at this university and that there was 27 people involved and that they did this, this, and that. All of that slows it down. I mean, I consider that wordiness in a lot of ways. And I think that it's because there's so much bad writing out there and because students come in contact with this model that they get from other professors that tell them, you need to basically make your paper as dry and boring as humanly possible, which is just not true, right? If you are more direct and clear, and you explain why those things are important, that's gonna make your paper so much better. So again, going back to the Jean Kilborn example, instead of saying, according to Jean Kilborn in her film, Killing a Softly Four, which is the fourth documentary in a four part series that she's been working on since the 1960s, including blah, 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 and giving us all this other background that we don't need. Just simply saying, saying you know, according to Jean Kilborn's research, uh, exposure, young women's exposure to media, um, ideal image of beauty can affect women's health and you know mental health right that's really all I'm looking for for all of that then the next sentence is you relating why that matters back to your paper right so then if you're writing a paper about like media and um, women's beauty image you would say like this is important in a culture where you know, young women come in contact with a lot of these messages. Like you would explain its importance or you would explain how it relates back to your research question or your, you know, basically your thesis statement, right? Um, and so again, really with the wordiness, it's not just about adding a lot of those like, although in those horrible transitions that people use, like therefore, 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 like a thousand times, even though they're not continuing a point, which is what therefore is supposed to be. Um, you know, I, I see a lot of that kind of wordiness problem, but honestly, the most wordiness I see or, or the most revision you will get back from your proposals are typically me cutting out all of that crap, research study crap out of it. Because the whole point is you are citing information. You are showing that you pulled information from that particular research study. We don't need to know everything about the research study. We just need to know what is relevant about that research to your point. That is really the breakthrough that some students have in this class that cause them to be excellent writers from here on out. Like I have um, some writing samples I'm gonna show you, um, you know, for sample final papers and things of that nature from a former student who's now um, completing her um, master's degree in uh, Scotland, um, very prestigious school, um, as a result actually of the paper she wrote in this class. Um, because a lot of what she did was not only did she read it and edit it herself and do several drafts of her paper, but the key thing that she did was she had people read it that were not sociologists. So I really highly suggest like there is the writing center um, via campus that you can use as a resource. There are the, sociolo uh, the sociology department writing tutors that are there specifically to help you, right? And if you are only online, I can get you in contact with their email addresses. Uh, you just have to contact me or come to online office hours and I will steer you in the direction of these people who are literally paid to help you. So that's kind of their job. Have someone read it. But sometimes having just a lay person in your life, like your significant other, a friend, a sibling, even in her case, the girl who did so excellent that you're going to see her sample papers, um, she actually had two kids she was babysitting read it, right? The youngest of which I think was 10 years old. And so her paper is very densely argued in a very uh, thoughtful way, leaning on a lot of citations, yet it's so readable because it's not so wordy, it's not filled with slangs and euphemism and all of this other crap that even a 10-year-old can read it and, ba and grasp the basic concepts of what she's saying, right? And this makes the paper not just 
um, academically weighty, but accessible, which is kind of the whole point of what I'm trying to teach in this class, is that we can make points academically, but we can do so without just boring the crap out of the reader, right? Okay, so if you're having trouble with some of these concepts, or if you could just use a refresher on these concepts, I highly recommend you take advantage of the exercise and word usage that starts on page 115 that has a lot of ways to work through these issues. And of course, you're going to have your um, word choice is going to be a part of your um, weekly writing exercise this week as well, um, so that you can kind of connect what you're reading in here to executing that for your paper.